There we go. Okay, so we're talking this time about, we're moving on, and we've been talking about membranes, uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about membranes and talking specifically about how recept membrane receptors work and signal transduction across the membrane works. So with that, let's just think about a couple things for a moment. First off, so if you are a multicellular organism, you have to, your cells somehow <coughs> have to coordinate with other cells. You can't, you can't just have a bunch of cells doing their own thing and not communicating with cells that are adjacent to them somehow. That, that just can't happen. Now that being said, I say this in the context of multicellular cells, this is also the case with most unicellular organisms as well. Even if you were a single cell organism, you still have to somehow communicate with and interact with other cells that are in your environment. No, no cell is like an island that can live as if there is no other life in, in the world. So cells need to communicate, excuse me, cells need to communicate in some, some method, but this is especially important if you are a multicellular organism because you, your functions not only have to somehow respond to those organisms around you, those other cells around you, they have to be intimately coordinated with those other, other things. So in order for them to all work together, they need to be able to communicate. What we're talking about here then specifically is how does that communication happen? How in the world do you have communication happening between different cells? Now, for this part, we're just going to begin talking about, we're mostly going to talk about the side in which, okay, a signal has been sent out. How does a cell receive that signal and therefore do something about that signal? Okay, so there's a couple different things that we need to talk about in reference to that. There are a couple different parts. And one of the first things is that you talk about the protein receptor you have some protein generally in the membrane that is a receptor for some specific molecule. And I say generally in that membrane because it's not always in the membrane. Usually this is a glycoprotein. Now that's not particularly surprising because most membrane brown proteins are glycoproteins. Many of them are glycosylated in some way, but in this case it's even more true about protein receptors. We also have this thing that is known as a ligand. The ligand we talked about a while back is just anything that is going to bind to a receptor and therefore have an effect. Oftentimes, this is a hormone. A, hormo a hormone just being any molecule that is, or any signal molecule that is given off by some cell. That's really weird that cell biology took me a while to grab the word cell. Like I was like, what is the word for that thing? <laughs> oh yeah, cell. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's just any signal molecule that's been given off by a cell that is going to act on another cell usually at some distance. Usually it's being carried some distance away from that cell. Um, when you talk about, there, there's a slight difference in definition of hormone, whether or not you're talking to cell biologists or physiologists. Um, and that, that, that concept of being distant is more important when you talk about, when you talk to physiologists, which is what I am, and cell biologists tend to de-emphasize at a distance. But that, that's really shades of meaning there. Those can bind and create what is known as the ligand receptor com complex. And this ligand receptor complex then goes on to alter some sort of cellular function. So the ligand receptor complex can then have some sort of action. It is really hot in this room. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to open that one. Getting frozen out, let me know because, like I said, it's probably not going to do any good for me up here. Okay. 
I need, I need water, like ice water. Why am I bringing this? I should bring ice water. <laughs> um, okay, and that, that different altered function could be a, a variety of things. We could be talking about gene regulation, enzyme activity, transport across the membrane. There's just a whole plethora of different things that that altered cellular function can be. This coffee is actually cold enough. It's cold now anyway, so it's, it's not that bad. Which Norman is like, yeah, but right now it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm awkward. That's just how I am. Um, okay, so hormones. Let's come back and talk about hormones again. <coughs> again, a hormone is just some blood borne molecule that is a signal or some sort of ligand. If you talk to a physiologist, yes. I'm a physiologist, so I'm telling you yes. <laughs> um, and and, and this, this comes back to what I was talking about is that uh, this kind of shades of meaning. Generally, we talk about at a distance, and for a physiologist, generally means that you're sticking that thing into the blood, and then um, it's, it's going out to a different place. So those are the endocrine or horm uh, the hormones. If you talk to um, people that are more shaded on the cell biology side, no, that it, it doesn't have to be blood I, I, I guess I should come back and say specifically, I mean, as an animal physiologist, we're talking blood because plants have hormones, and by if you go really strictly by this definition, then plants can't have hormones because they don't have blood. Um, so it, it really comes back to kind of shades of meaning there. We're, we're generally talking uh, a molecule that's having an action at a distance. And, and for animals generally, especially like vertebrates and mammals and things like that, we're talking about things that are bloodborne. However, that being said, that's not always the case. And these are going to be produced in one cell and it's going to bind to a receptor on another cell and have some sort of effect on that cell. It's one thing that, if you get more and more deep into different different areas of biology and science, uh, you find more and more that um, they all have kind of like their own little cultures and dialects, and they use the same words and sometimes mean them in slightly different ways. So a physiologist and a cell biologist will use words slightly different ways, uh, even though like their technical meaning is very close to being the same. It is like shades of meaning. Same thing with like. Molecular biologists and biochemists, or molecular biologists and cell biologists, it, it, there gets to be like just shades of difference there. And so, me being an animal physiologist, I was trained hormones are blood borne acting at a distance. Not, not, not going to be the same definition <coughs> for everyone. Okay. Okay, there's really two major classes then of hormones that we're going to talk about. The first being the lipid soluble hormones. Primarily, these are going to be steroids. Okay, now if you're lipid soluble, you're a small lipid soluble molecule, what kind of special characteristics might you have, especially when we're talking about cells? Yes, exactly. You can diffuse through a membrane if you're small and lipid sol soluble. And so most of these lipid soluble hormones pass just right through membranes really easily. And the cool thing is, I think it's cool, is that they're going to generally bind to a receptor inside the cell, an intracellular receptor. So it's not going to be membrane bound. Yes, Ricky. So they're small, but like I was thinking CO2 and N2 and O2 small, but that's like, they're not, no, they're nowhere near that small. They're not quite that small, no. But in, in the range of <coughs> lipid soluble hormones, steroids specifically, are on the bigger end of what you can get diffusing through a cell membrane. Um, that's on the bigger end. 
Now, still, if you're looking at like the range of organic molecules, they're still much closer to the CO2 than they are to things like proteins and polysaccharides and other things like that. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are still on the small end of the scale, like, like by a good amount. Um, but yeah, they, they are, if you're looking at the range of things that, that are liposoluble and can easily pass through a membrane, you have probably CO2 on one end, and then you have steroids on the other end, and then things kind of within that range are things that easily pass through the membrane. There's actually a few things that are larger than, than uh, steroids that can get through the membrane, but you're getting increasingly slow diffusion through there because there's increasing resistance. So these have several different characteristics. Number one, lipid soluble hormones generally bind to an intracellular uh, receptor. Is that hormone receptor complex then oftentimes, but not exclusively, oftentimes is then going to enter the nucleus and alter gene expression. That is the major action of lipid soluble hormones. The reason the, the consequence of this, then, is that these tend to have slow responses. If your response includes altering gene expression, that's not going to be happening within seconds. That's not the kinds of responses that can happen really quickly. We are now talking about things that at their absolute breakneck fastest might happen within hours, but are more likely to happen within days to weeks. And also, those responses are long-lasting. One signal can have responses that can last for sometimes the entire life of the organism to at least, we're talking at the very shortest, we're still talking days to weeks with this, like how long this response lasts. You have a graphical illustration of this. Uh, again, we have some lipid soluble hormone just hopping along. Hey, does this actually point? No, excellent. Uh, so we have some lipid soluble hormone that's just going along in the bloodstream and can just very easily diffuse through <laughs> cell membranes right here out into the, the extracellular space, just right into a cell and bind into a receptor hormone complex here. Then that receptor hormone complex is generally transported to bring it up into the nucleus and then it can bind to different uh, factors there, even sometimes in the DNA itself and change DNA expression. And then what you get out of that is then some different proteins being produced. Of course, that's, that's the uh, consequence of that. Let me just run through a handful of these. Um, and I'm not, you don't need to know the structure of these, but you should know basically which ones are, are steroids and which ones are other things. So for instance, we have this testosterone. Again, this is the, your typical four member ring steroid we have three six-member rings and a five-member ring. This testosterone. We have estradiol as well, one of the major estrogen molecules. But then you also have ones that are slightly bigger and just really common to everyone. Cortisol is a, a hormone as well. But there's not all of these are steroids. So, for instance, one that is really important is thyroxin. Thyroxin is made by your thyroid. And this is the major... Um, one of the most major regulators of your long-term metabolism. There's actually two different forms. There's T3, T4. It depends on how many iodines that there are in there. So they have this really kind of a funny one because very few things in your body have iodine in them, but thyroxin is, is by far, far, far the most major usage of iodine that you have. So this as well, a lipid-soluble hormone this is one that is a bit bigger than, um, well, no, it's a little bit smaller, actually, than, than the, uh, the steroids. The other major class that we have are peptide hormones. As you can imagine, these are going to be either uh, proteins or amino acids or their derivatives. So these generally are not going to be lipid soluble. Everyone's going to have a nice big little amine group on there, carboxylic acid uh, group on one end. These are not going to be generally lipid soluble, which means then 
these don't end these don't enter the cell. They can't diffuse through the membrane. So instead what they do is they're going to bind to a cell surface receptor. And each then specific receptor is going to determine which cells are affected and how they're affected. And this is kind of the slick thing about, about hormones as opposed to other things is that Really, the specificity of hormones is not where you send the signal. Most hormones get sent everywhere. And the specificity comes when you are actually looking at how that signal is transduced. Either a cell is going to have a receptor for that hormone or it won't. If it has a receptor, it will respond to that hormone. If it doesn't have that receptor, it won't respond to that hormone. And then those different receptors even the receptors that, that are affected can be slightly different, so they have a different effect in different cells. So those cells can respond differently to the exact same hormones of them. One of the major mechanisms that makes this go is this thing we call a G protein in second messenger system. So a second messenger system is, is just one of these systems in which we have a hormone that's going to bind to a cell surface receptor. And that that is what we know is the first messenger. It can't actually get into the cell, so it binds to a, a cell hormone, or excuse me, a, a cell uh, surface receptor. In response to that, it's going to activate this membrane-bound protein called a G protein. And I'll talk about why it's called a G protein in just a little bit. The G protein then transmits that signal to another membrane protein. This other membrane protein is now going to be called the effector. And in turn, that, that other membrane protein, or that other protein, is going to produce another intracellular molecule that then enacts some action. This is the second method. So we have a receptor, it binds to the ligand, ligand on the outside of the membrane, on the outside of the cell, it is going to then activate a G protein. The G protein then activates another protein, which is the effector, and then that protein creates or releases some sort of molecule on the inside of the cell, which is then the second message. Let me, I'm going to give you a couple of very specific examples. And let me know, if that, if that doesn't answer your question, let me know. That's By pig, I'm following. Yeah. It, yes, it's happening from the outside to the inside. But usually, the, um, the receptor is going to be a transmembrane protein. <laughs> the G protein is going to be peripheral on the inside. It's a, it's a integral protein. And then you have another one that's on the inside as well. Usually the effect is on the inside. It can either be membrane brown or not. It's then the second messenger that actually con that actually causes whatever is going to happen on the inside of the cell. That second messenger, whatever is created by the effector protein, is what ends up having the final effect. So G proteins are interesting. G protein second messenger systems are the most common messenger system in animals. This is most commonly how we are getting messages from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. It's not the only one, and we're going to talk about a few others uh, before this particular lecture is out or done by next Friday. But it is the most common. In addition, there's a ton of diseases that are associated with G protein messenger systems. Things like seasonal allergies are directly, or uh, there is a G messenger, or G protein second messenger system directly involved with that. Also hypertension is another one that is directly involved with that. And because of this, G protein second messenger systems are one of the most common targets of drugs. In fact, it turns out nearly half, 40% of all prescription drugs target G protein systems. 
has a ton. And far and away, that makes it the, the single most commonly targeted class of system that you have by drugs. It's, it's, it's far and away most. And so there's actually a, a, this was, so important has been the characterization of G messenger second, or G protein second messenger systems that there's actually been two different Nobel prizes that have been awarded based on their, their discovery and um, just characterization. This guy is named Earl Wilbur Sutherland Jr. He actually discovered the epinephrine, epinephrine uh, secondary messenger system, which is a G protein system. And he figured out that it could stimulate the conversion of, of uh, glycogen to glucose in the liver. And he, found, he also figured out that the, the messenger epinephrine itself had no in, intracellular effects. It didn't directly enter the cell. That even if you put epinephrine into the cell, it would not have the same effect as if it was applied to the outside. And figured out instead what the epinephrine did is somehow stimulated the increase of cyclic AMP on the inside. Yeah. Earl Wilbur Sutherland Jr. I like that name. And so he didn't actually characterize the entire the entire pathway. But he was key in discovering the idea of the second messenger system. That we had epinephrine on the outside that bound to something, and it never went inside the cell. Instead, what we had is somehow epinephrine on the outside stimulated the production of cyclic AMP on the inside, and it was cyclic AMP, actually, that had the effect. Some years after that, these two guys. Um, this guy on the, on the left-hand side is Martin Ro Rod Bell. And then Al Alfred Gilman is this, these guy, this guy here. These together shared a Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1994, and they specifically characterized the, the G protein system that's involved with this. So they're actually still working on epinephrine. And what they found is that you actually had this GTP-bound membrane or GTP-bound um, protein that was in the membrane that was facilitating this. So they actually started uh, characterizing specifically how this cascade works. And they're the specific ones. They were working in the 60s and did this. Obviously, this guy got this picture taken in the 90s because that background could have only happened in like 1992. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's actually a third Nobel Prize was handed out for this. And this is this is a little bit uh, more indirect, but uh, Ryan Kobilka and Robert Lefkowitz, they were specifically looking at the beta adrenergic receptors. Um, and again, beta adrenergic receptors, these are the ones that are responding, specifically responding to epinephrine. And so, or one of the classes that's responding to epinephrine, there's actually several different ones, but they actually determined the specific structure of the epinephrine receptor and specifically figured out the structure of the G protein that coupled with it and, and how that worked together. So you have from Earl Wilbur Sutherland that was working back in the, I believe the 1940s, 1930s doing his work that actually found like the basic parts of <coughs> actually, okay, so we have this, this epinephrine on the outside that doesn't enter the cell, but somehow stimulates the inside of the cell to change and, and characterize how that change happens. And then we had Rod Bell and uh, Gilman come along later and actually characterize what interacting proteins along that pathway actually carried out that process. And then these two guys, Lefkowitz and Kobilka, come, come along later and actually characterize the exact kind of structure of those those molecules, particularly the G protein and the beta adrenergic receptor, and how does that actually work? How do they actually interact together? And so, all like, so this basic stuff that we're going to be going over is like three Nobel Prizes worth of, of information. 
Um, and as we saw, just how intimately involved they are with human health kind of gives you a good idea of why that was such a big, like, Ugh! like exactly that. Okay. So let's talk about G proteins more specifically. So the G is there because what we have is we have a guanine nucleotide binding site on there. So guanine nucleotide, what we specifically mean is either GTP or GDP. This is similar to ADP or ATP. Uh, we have, but instead the, the nucleotide on there is, is guanine instead of adenosine. And what we have here is a heterotrimer. So we have, it has three subunits, the alpha, beta, and the gamma, and they are not the same. That's what we mean by heterotrimer. Hetero mean different, trimer mean three different parts. And again, we have alpha. In humans, we have actually 12 or 20 different genes or 20 different types of alpha subunits. We have the beta. There's five different uh, types of beta subunits in humans. And then the gamma, which has about 12 different types in humans. And again, these can be mixed and matched in various combinations in different cells. So actually, this leads to a huge variety of different G proteins that you can possibly have based on these 20 different types of these different subunits that you can switch out. So the alpha subunit is the specific one that has the GDP that's attached to it. Earlier on, you will have a ligand that binds to the GPRC. Why, what I mean by GPRC is the G protein coupled receptor. So this is different than, I'm not right now talking about the G protein, but this is, this is a specific receptor independent of the G protein. But imagine we now have a ligand that binds to the G protein coupled receptor. It's a specific because it's, it's going to interact with the G protein. These are always seven pass transmembrane proteins. This G protein coupled receptor has a high affinity site for the G protein on it. So that receptor has this, this place, this high affinity site for the G protein, and it doesn't become the high affinity site until it binds to the ligand. Then it turns it into this high affinity state, and then the G protein coupled receptor will bind to the G protein. So again, we start off with the G protein having a GDP attached. It has a GDP attached to begin with it. We go and we have the G protein coupled receptor bind to it after the ligand binds. And then once the G protein binds to the high affinity site, it's going to undergo a conformational change like we've seen with a lot of proteins can do when you bind to something. This will cause the GDP to unbind and the GTP, a G, another GTP, to come in and bind. Again, this is specifically happening on the alpha subunit. From there, the alpha is going to unbind. The alpha subunit is going to unbind from the beta and gamma subunits. And from the receptor and just go off and do its own thing, kind of. So a recap, we have a G protein there, just minding its own business, has a GDP attached to it. Along comes a G protein coupled receptor with a ligand now on it, and it binds to that G protein. That causes the G protein to dump its GDP and attach to a GTP. It, once that happens, that also causes the A alpha subunit to unbind from that complex and go off and do something. What that something is, is that alpha subunit is then going to modulate some effector. It's then going to interact with some other protein and do something. And that something is going to be a variety of things that we're going to talk about. That, that depends on what specific pathway that we're talking about. Once that happens, 
alpha then, generally in the course of doing that, will hydrolyze this GTP to a GDP, and then return to the beta gamma subunit, rebind to it, and then that whole complex unbinds from the G protein coupled receptor. Yeah? Is it the same beta gamma subunit that it was originally from, or can you find like another one that just doesn't have an alpha subunit in the yeah. that one? Mm -hmm. But it has to be, you'll have, it has to be the same type that was before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it has to be coupled to the same G protein coupled receptor. It <coughs> doesn't, yeah, it's not going to just bind to any of them. And so oftentimes, what, what you have in reality is you can think of many of these are working kind of all the time in any given cell. And so it, it, has, it needs to come back to the same type that it is unbound from. But it doesn't have to be the exact same thing. Yeah. What does it look like on the macro scale? Like, like with this alpha thing does the thing, and then what does the human, what does the human like experience? I'll talk about that. Like, there's several things. Like, we're going to go through several specific examples of this. Um, uh, you could experience not dying is one of the things that you could experience, <laughs> which is a good thing. Like, I often consider that good. Every day that I don't die, I'm happy about not dying. <laughs> okay. So that alpha can do several different things. It can either act as an activator or inhibitor. It can activate something to start working, some... Or to actually go out and inhibit something, like stop something from working as well. But this is kind of cool because what this means now is that we can have one hormone in some in some specific cells, it could act as an activator of a process. And other cells, depending on what kind of G protein coupled receptor and G proteins that you have present in that membrane, they can actually act as an inhibitor or do something completely different. But it means that one hormone can have different effects in different cells. <coughs> and, and to me, like as a physiologist, this is one of the really interesting things that happens with hormones is that oftentimes, what's really interesting is that hormones tend to have a coordinated effect across your body. It will have different effects in different places in your body, but those different effects tend to all fit together to elicit some kind of grand response in the organism. Like if I were to give you epinephrine, right now, if I just gave you a shot of epinephrine, in some of your cells, it is going to cause them to ramp up all the, all the processes for energy production and energy usage. And actually in some other cells, it does exactly the opposite. It will downregulate. It will start to ramp down all the processes for energy usage. And it's like, why in the world would you do that? It doesn't make any sense to do opposite things. You're just making yourself out. Well, as it turns out, that you tend to ramp up energy usage and energy production and things like muscles and stuff like that. And only in certain muscles. Like, so skeletal muscles will start to do that. But actually, like, the smooth muscles surrounding your gut, it actually starts ramping down energy usage because you don't need to be digesting things when like, your body is coursing with adrenaline. But those all coordinate to produce some sort of big result, some sort of coordinated result in that organism to help them survive in its environment. But they can be polar opposite and all happening because of one hormone, the exact same hormone, which is cool. Okay, so just, just as a graphical re-representation of this. Back here, okay, we're all on the same page now. Again, we have a G protein coupled receptor here. Again, this is a, a seven pass. It's going to bind to a ligand and, and a mash a couple things here together. But once that does it, it binds with the G protein here that has GDP attached to it is then going to drop that GDP and pick up a GTP. And that alpha then goes off by itself to then act on some effector that's going to do a thing. OK. So just as a lead into what we're going to talk about on Monday, there's four of these that we're going to specifically talk about uh, that we're going to go through the specifics. The adenyl cyclase and cyclic AMP, second messenger system, uh, calcium channels and uh, calcium, this is a calmodulin pathway, phospholipase C and IP3, and then finally the 1, 2, I, uh, diacylglycerol. These are four different second messenger systems. They're G protein mediated that we're going to be 
going specifically through on Monday, beginning on Monday. One thing I'll, I'll just, I have, not only have I put the slides up for this, but I'm going to get into like some nice, fun, let's see, can I see all my slides here? Um, some nice, fun diagrams like this. I have all of these up on a handout by themselves, separate from the slides on D2L. So you can, you can go through and get like this one, and this one, and this one. They're all really fun. Okay, have a great weekend. Rest a little bit, recover from this week. I'll see you back here on Monday. Enjoy your day. Okay.